Oh, yeah, that was great. That was in Kilburn in, uh, I think it was Sydney. I'm not sure now. But the house underneath had, because uh, most of the houses were on stilts, you know, because the air used to go underneath. There was no air conditioning in those days. So the air would go underneath and warm and cool the house down, you know. So downstairs was always a laundry and things. So you'd go down and underneath we had these four or five rooms that were built there before I mean, we rented this house. So, so we'd build these cardboard boxes and we'd cut like a square in it like that, like a TV screen and break off the end of binoculars, the, the small ends, <laughs> break them off, stick them into the box, and if you look through that, you see a perfect TV. <laughs> you know, and it looks like, oh, this looks just like a telly, you know. And then Barry would sit there and read the news, and i go, and I'm the only one who's having fun here, because I'm looking through the box. And then Robin would could take his turn and go, oh, yeah, it's just like telly. <laughs> of course, we never could transmit. <laughs> Well, what happened is we, we always looked for some really cool name. And I remember the first, because Skiffle was a, the big music that was in at the time in England. And there's a man called Lonnie Donegan and uh, Johnny Douglas, Johnny Duncan, I should say, uh, who had these hits of, of sort of Skiffle, like washboard, you know, banjo guitars and, and very exciting music. And it was sort of blues, but country at the same time. And it was, it was great stuff. And that was the big music of the time. So Rattlesnakes was very skiffle. And I played the tea chest, which is this chest with the aluminum corners. And, and you'd have the broom handle and the piece of rope. And, you'd, and I was playing bass. So that's how we used to stand on the street corner <laughs> in Chorton Kamadi playing. I used to have the tea chest thing, and I'd be playing the bass. And that was a very skiffle thing, to play sort of instruments that you made from home stuff, you know. So. Um, that was very popular, so rattlesnakes was a very cool word. And then we heard of a guy called Wee Willie Harris, who is... <laughs> this man was, was big red hair stuck out, and he wore this, this Tarzan-type leopard skin thing. No trousers, just, you know, short. And played the piano like, like Little Richard. But was as white as anything, but very white, actually, and very freckly. So he was, he was a big pop star, he had this big hit. And we sort of thought, well, we Johnny Hayes and the Blue Cats sounds really cool because we asked Mum to get us three pairs of blue jeans. And they weren't like Levi's, like, you know, like jeans that they had. They were very badly, cheaply made, bright blue <laughs> trousers. So we, could, we thought they were jeans, and the three of us had them on, and we went, right, it's we Johnny Hayes and the Blue Cats. And we thought, well, who's we Johnny Hayes? And we went, we don't know. Nobody was really we Johnny Hayes. <laughs> but we just thought it was such a cool name. So we had that for a while. Then with the Bill Good, Bill Gates connection, uh, after Bill had, had done uh, his thing on the radio, they came back to the house and we were sitting and just talking around, thinking about a name. And of course there was Brothers Gibb. Uh, and there was, of course, Bill and Bill Gates had noticed there was Bill Good, Barry, Barbara, my mum, Brothers Gibb, their initials. He said, there's so many BGs in the room. He said, why don't you just be called the BGs? Which was B dot G apostrophe S then. So we thought, oh, okay. So, which really, as he said, stood for Brothers Gibb. But there's so many BG initials in the room, you know, that's what you're going to be called. In fact, when we got to England, if the first record didn't go, we were going to change the name. Because we've been the Bee Gees for like 11 years. You know, so we thought maybe if we change our name, it'll be hipper in England, you know. So Spicks and Specks was released, and it did really well. The New York mining disaster was a deciding record. If that didn't make it, we were going to change our name. And we had names like Rupert's World, um, <laughs> The Monmouths, I think, was another one. Oh, God, they were so funny. Uh, of all the names that we could be, but New York Mining Disaster, strange enough, was, was, a, was a hit. So it was, it was a minor hit, but it got us established in uh, England, and we thought it was too late then. Because so. my father loved them, desperately. I mean, he was madly in love with the Mills Brothers. In fact, I think he thought we were three little white Mills Brothers, because <laughs> he really, but the, some of the songs we used to do in our stage act were Mills Brothers songs, because we had to work to adults. So we sang songs like Bye Bye Blackbird and Alexander's Ragtime Band and Diner and Up the Lazy River. I mean, things that the, the Mills Brothers had done that we would do. We would just impersonate their harmonies and just sing them in the clubs. And th they taught us light and shade in vocals. You know, the softness and when you can be louder and when you can be softer and, and more emotional, you know. So my father always had these records playing around the house. And big bands, you know, Glenn Miller, stuff like that. You know, which is all good stuff, but to me, it's not my taste in music, but, you know, you can't but admire the, the talent 
of these people. I mean, wonderful stuff. The best one for me was doing the Savile Theatre. When a year before we supported Pat's Domino, Jerry and the Pacemakers, and I think it was the Flower Pot Men or something like that. Or oh, Grapefruit, <laughs> there was another group. And they went on and we were one of those first groups that went on. Well, the audience that went to see Pat's Domino don't want to see you guys. Now, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Jerry's been around. Jerry's a Liverpool, and he knew how to talk to the audience, so he got them. Well, we were totally in, un, in, in knee deep here. We didn't know what to do. Robin got pelted with an egg, this, that, and the other, and all this stuff happened, because they were like rockers for Pat's Domino. So the nicest moment for me was doing our show a year from that, from that day in the same theater, and it was our show. And Paul McCartney and Brian and Lulu again and a few other people, my mum and everybody were in the box watching the show. And I went for dinner with Paul and Jane Asher after the show into this club. And that was my night. I was like in heaven. It's way out in Harrowville, but it's an old chateau. Now, chateau sounds absolutely gorgeous, doesn't it? Beautiful building, big type steeples, great grounds and gardens and ponds and fountains. No. It's nothing like that. It was a half-built castle-type place with these turrets that were falling apart, no central eating, nothing. And it was a dump. The studio was cool. It had a ghost in it, everything. So we go there to make our new album. That's the reason. Once again, this is all for tax reasons that were going on in those days. And we went to France, and this is the studio we picked to go. So uh, we recorded... We'd already had sort of staying Alive in mind. We already had that song sort of going because we played it to, in Bermuda to Robert, and uh, he, th he said you should change it to Saturday night. We said no. And uh, so we finished that in Harrowville. We, we got the idea to put that down and, and also um, How Deep Is Your Love. The first one we actually did, I think, was If I Can't Have You, I think. And we wrote it on the stairs inside the, once again, Echo. It was great, this pool room they had, but it was on a high turret type of spiral staircase. Three of us sat in that staircase and wrote If I Can't Have You for ABBA, actually, within mind. Because we thought, God, with their harmonies, what would they do? And so that's how If I Can't Have You was born. Barry's a very compassionate person. He's a very loving person, very protective. Um, and that shows in his writing as well, his compassion. And his... Sometimes he can be a little extrovert, but more than anything, he totally believes in what he's doing totally believes in the song, totally believes in the show, totally believes in whatever he does. If he can't do it right, he doesn't want to do it. We're all mad perfectionists. Robin is quietly... <laughs> he's, he's a genius. I mean, Robin is incredible. Um, they don't make people like Robin anymore. Uh, Robin, once again, is not a person who would say, oh, I love my brothers, or I'm group hug, <laughs> you know, none of that stuff. <laughs> he's saying, oh, that's it, isn't it? He just thinks everything's as it is, you know, and he takes everything as he sees it. But he's not stupid either. He's a very, he's very much into the business. He knows, I mean, he can talk to you about any record that went to number one in 1969 in August. What was the flip side? Who produced it? <laughs> what number did it go to or what, when did it enter at? He could tell you all the stuff about music that you wouldn't believe. He's one great big book of knowledge. He loves to read and ask him about anything, and he'll tell you the answer. He'll tell you who Churchill's secretary was during World War II and what affair she had with another guy. I mean, he'll tell you what toilet paper the boy used. I mean, everything. Amazing source of, of uh, knowledge.